Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, sorry about the weather. Uh, we hadn't planned on this, so I'm glad you all were able to make it here. Uh, this program is the final installment of a four-part series uh, that is meant to explore the politics and planning in Boston in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, the past sessions explored essentially how Boston went from a city with a declining population uh, and on the edge of an economic abyss uh, to becoming really uh, one of the biggest economic juggernauts uh, in the country. Uh, this program uh, is exploring new territory, or at least uncommon territory for uh, MHS, which is that rather than talking about the past, we're going to talk about the future. Uh, so the program tonight will explore uh, what we can learn from the past 50 years of planning and politics in Boston, uh, looking forward to where we're going uh, in the next 50 years or so. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to cover a couple quick logistics. Um, the Massachusetts Historical Society is an independent nonprofit organization, so we rely on membership and support to be able to produce programs like this. So if you are not a member, uh, I would encourage you to consider joining uh, or making a contribution to support these programs. Uh, if you're using one of our uh, assisted listening devices, it would be good to turn it on now. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but let me know if you have any questions. Um, the discussion this evening uh, is being recorded uh, and will be shared uh, uh, with MHS's website and the WGBH forum network, uh, just so anyone knows that if they ask questions later. Um, this program uh, will follow the format of a short presentation by our moderator uh, and then uh, a structured discussion among the panelists and then a Q&A uh, discussion that will follow. Um, finally, uh, I would just like to thank um, the supporters who made this series possible. Uh, the series wouldn't have been possible without the support of our underwriter, the Architectural Heritage Foundation, and our contributors, the Boston Area Research Initiative and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. We'd also like to thank our uh, supporting members uh, who are listed in our program. Um, and I would also like to introduce our moderator this evening, uh, who is David Luberoff. Uh, he is a senior uh, project advisor for the Boston Area Research Initiative, a lecturer on, so on sociology at Harvard University, uh, and the Boston Portal co-director with the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative. From 2004 to 2012, he was the executive director of Harvard's Rappaport Institute uh, for Greater Boston. He has also been the associate director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a lecturer at both the Kennedy School and Harvard's Graduate School of Design. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to David. And thank you to Gavin. Um, so we're gonna take a slightly different tack uh, tonight in part because we can't show you slides of the future uh, and try and structure this a, a little bit more as a conversation. Um, and I just want to take a, a minute or two to, to provide really a context for those of you who are turning in. You know, previously on um, the, the transformation of Boston um, in, the, in the events you didn't miss. So about a, six weeks ago, we came together and uh, really started to look at where this city was in, in the late 50s, early, early 60s, roughly 50 years ago. Um, and I think we walked away from that with uh, a renewed appreciation for what a state of doldrums Boston was in, uh, an economy that really had ground to a halt, very little development activity, the beginnings of significant outflows uh, of people uh, to the suburbs and to other parts of the country. Uh, and just the beginnings of really a, a the large influx uh, of African Americans into the city. And the policy response of the time, the dominant response, was essentially that we have to destroy the village to save it uh, of urban renewal and, and urban highways. And uh, those of you who were here at that first uh, event will recall a fairly spirited discussion, uh, <laughs> um, uh, which included several of, of the people who were quite active uh, in, in that. Um, in, in the second um, discussion, which was moderated uh, by Byron Rushing, uh, whose style I cannot uh, even try to emulate, um, you know, we really looked at out of, coming out of both the resistance, uh, the fierce resistance to the highways and, and urban renewal projects, and this rise of community activism, combined with this rediscovery of the city, sort of a la Jane Jacobs, um, the emergence of a whole set of, of institutions uh, really focused on rebuilding the city from the neighborhood up. Um, the invention of, of these things called and, and uh, real development of, of community development corporations, of community health centers, ultimately uh, resulting in one of the most interesting CDC type organizations with our, one of our panelists headed, uh, the uh, DSNI uh, in, in the Dudley area. Um, 
And, and the, the significant role that those entities played in transforming the city, in highlighting the, 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 the qualities of urbanism that many of us have come to love about Boston and many of us who did, were not born here uh, chose to live here because, uh, be, because we appreciated those. And, and the continued demographic and, and economic and social changes in the city. And then um, about two weeks ago, we went across the river to the Stata Center uh, at MIT, which is a very different building than this one. Um, it's, a little, it's a little daunting to moderate a panel with all these eminences looking at you, and, and you as well. Um, and, and looked at sort of the, the, the resurgent Boston economy of, uh, that really starts to take off in the 80s and 90s, um, and call it what you will, the knowledge-based economy, the eds and meds, but, but the, uh, both the development boom uh, in private development, Tony Pangaro, I thought, gave us some really fabulous insights into how development has gotten done in Boston. Um, and uh, Ed's and Med's. Um, we, we had Barbara Rubel uh, from Tufts, talking particularly about Tufts Medical Center, um, and Kathy Spiegelman, who brought the perspectives of both Harvard and, and Northeastern um, to the fore, and Cairo Shen talking about the transformation of, of the Boston Redevelopment Authority as, as an entity that in many respects did less planning and more essentially serving as a forum of, of negotiation between uh, both private and nonprofit entities and communities uh, in, until through whatever uh, magical process the VRA uh, and City Hall operates under, deciding that things were, were ready to move forward. And, and that cues us up for today uh, of trying to think about, given this remarkable transformation, you know, a city that was almost left for dead in, in many respects. Um, famously, Mayor Hines landing in Boston in the 1950s, looking out the window of his airplane going, where's Boston? <laughs> Where is the, you know, there's a Custom House Tower and a John Hancock building and the New England Life building and not a heck of a lot else, to a, a city that is thriving, that uh, has Joe Moakley's favorite bird, the crane, uh, everywhere, and, um, and yet has many, kind of new challenges, in, including uh, very serious challenges about how to make sure that the benefits of that growth are, are widely shared. So we've brought together three uh, really extraordinary people um, to, to help us think about that. Um, rather than asking each of them to make a presentation, we're hoping to have more of a, of a conversation. Uh, and at some point, we would like to bring you into the conversation. I think we'll probably go to a little bit after 7. Uh, which will leave us about a half an hour or so uh, for audience uh, Q &A, um, and A, and other uh, and 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 some of your reflections on both where we've come from and, and where we're going. So let me let me start off um, at at the regional level. You have folks bios uh, in your in your programs, um, so I won't do extensive biographies. But Mark Drazen, uh, since two thousand and two has been the executive director of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and before that uh, was president and CEO of the State Association of CDCs. Uh, he's also been a state representative uh, and a candidate for lieutenant governor. Uh, but as the head of the regional planning agency, you presumably spend some portion of your waking hours thinking about where we're at and where we might be going. And so let me start by asking you both, as you reflect back, on the last 50 years. What do you think of as, as a particularly significant change? And more important, as you look forward, what do you see as two or three of the most pressing challenges or promising opportunities for this region? Okay. So this says, don't touch. <clears throat> they all say, don't touch. And does that mean I'm not supposed to bend I think this you can, forward? I think you can no? bend the okay? mic forward, right. but okay, don't touch I'm... the thing under where it all says, right, don't very touch. Good. Thank you, David. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here, obviously, with David and John and Cassandra. Uh, and uh, it's also just a pleasure to be here with, with this group of folks. I've already, when I was at the reception, ran into and met a number of friends who I haven't seen in a long time. And now I see so many more just sitting out there in the room. So I hope I'll get a chance to talk to you a little bit afterwards. Um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to speak a little bit more of the future uh, David, because that's the objective of today's forum, and I think that in the last three forums, you've probably heard a great deal about 
about the past and about what's occurred, and I, I'm not sure I can add to that at all. But I thought a little bit on the way over here about a few things that I would talk about, and I, I don't think that any of the three things I'm going to mention are surprising, but I will try to speak about them in a slightly surprising way, if possible, because one of my friends came over to me in here and said, make sure to tell me something I don't know. So <laughs> it's a very intelligent room, so I don't know if that's going to be possible, but I'll give it a try. So one of the things that our organization does as the regional planning agency is approximately every four years we try and project what is likely to happen over the course of the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years in terms of three factors, population, <coughs> employment, and housing demand. And we put out our last um, projections about a year and a half ago. Uh, we really focused heavily on the housing issue. And then subsequently those projections were a big part of the mayor's housing plan. But our, our housing projections were for the entire region, most of eastern Massachusetts. And it demonstrated, among other things, that we will need to create about 435,000 units of housing between the year 2010 and the year 2040. That's about 14,000 units of housing a year. In a very, very good year, we hit 10 or 12. It's not uncommon for us to hit five or six. There are places in the region that are aggressively pursuing housing growth, but there are others that are very insistent about making sure that there is very little additional housing in their communities. Most people know that we need a lot of housing, and generally they know that by virtue of the fact that housing is very expensive. Rents in the greater Boston region went up every year except one during the Great Recession. So either by 2009 or 2010, they were already going up again. Sales prices have not been quite as strong, but obviously still strong. And it is increasingly difficult for us to have a match between supply and demand. I think there are a few things about this that people don't commonly realize. One is that it is not just a social justice issue. It's very much an economic issue that we face because over the course of the next few decades, or maybe it's one decade, I'm not quite sure, but most of a huge number of our baby boomers are going to retire, about 40% of the workforce. And we do not have enough younger people to fill those jobs much less the new jobs that we would like to attract to the region. If we're going to have people to fill those jobs, they need, for the most part, a place to live. Generally speaking, when we speak to people or research the issue, what we're told is that one of the reasons it's difficult to attract people to Greater Boston is the high cost of living, and the single biggest factor in the high cost of living is the high cost of owning or renting a home. Another thing that I think is particularly important to remember, particularly for the city of Boston, is over the period that you have studied in these sessions, one of the biggest contributors to growth in the city has been its immigrant population. During years when the city was growing, immigrants were at the forefront. During years even when the city was shrinking, the immigrant population often made it less bad than it would otherwise have been. It is very, very difficult for immigrants from other countries at this point, with the exception of a fairly narrow social band of immigrants, to find a place to live in the city of Boston. The immigrant population is almost exclusively moving to other cities, particularly gateway cities, parts of western Massachusetts and other places. I am a person who believes that the immigrant population has contributed a tremendous amount socially, economically, and in a whole variety of other ways artistically to the growth and development and improvement of the city of Boston. And we will face a challenge in keeping them here and keeping them coming here unless we deal with the housing issue. And another thing I would say about the housing issue that may be a little bit of a twist on the normal discussion about high rents and sales prices is who gets to live in a house in the city of Boston these days? Or who gets to live in a home in many of our, shall I say, hotter suburban communities where prices are very, very high? In the past, 
you could count on a lot of folks living in those houses being middle class families raising children who went to the public schools. That is a really tough economic formulation at the moment. Not everywhere and not necessarily in all times of the cycle, the economic cycle, but generally it is still a very, very difficult thing to work economically. And if we can't have families who are middle class families who can, or never mind, lower income families who can locate here, stay here, and send their children to the public schools, it creates a whole series of social disconnects between critical institutions in the city and in the relationship between cities like Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville where the market is very hot and the rest of the metropolitan area. So I'm an old housing planner and David knows that when I start with housing, I tend to outstay my welcome on that. I'm gonna briefly mention therefore two other things that I think are very, very important and they can perhaps be the, the topic of further conversation. We are going to see a tremendous increase in transit demand <coughs> in the greater Boston region over the course of the next 10, 20, 40 years. There are many reasons for this. It's not simply because we are a relatively transit dependent city. We put a lot of people on the T every day. Most people know that. And if the population of the city and the metro Boston region is growing, and it is, you would expect that to put more people on the T. But there are other reasons for it that are also interesting to know. One is that we're creating more jobs. And those jobs create a back and forth in terms of commuting. Also, we see on the T, on bicycles and in cars, a smaller and smaller percentage of the trips are actually commute to and from work trips. So as those other trips increase, you also see an increased demand for the T. Also, people are getting their licenses later in life. They are driving less frequently. More people are multimodal and they have a tendency to live in the urbanized areas without a car for a portion of their life after retirement. And for a whole host of these reasons, we see people using transit and other alternative modes more than they are cars. The intense congestion at the center of our system particularly <coughs> calls for better management at the T, a careful review of capital expenditures, but also an actual growth plan for the T. I was out in Seattle recently. It's actually a city to city tour. The mayor was there, as John knows. Seattle's a very similar city to Boston in many ways, although it's hard to know that in January. But, um, you know, almost the same size, a small part of the overall metropolitan region, growing a lot faster out there, obviously, than here, but in many ways similar. The legislature raised the gas tax by 12 cents in the last couple of years. A lot of that is going to transit development. They have regional ballot initiatives. They passed one in November to create seven new bus rapid transit lines. And another such referendum is on the ballot next November. It might or might not pass, but a lot of these initiatives have passed in Houston, in Denver, in Seattle, in the Bay Area, in Los Angeles in red and blue states all over America, people are building and expanding transit systems. And we're kind of stuck with the one we've got. We can't get a tiny green line extension, two miles from Lechmere to, or maybe it's four miles. Four, to, four miles, <laughs> yes, four miles from Lechmere to either College Ave or Route 16. We've got to figure out a plan for handling this. It needs to involve reforms at the T. It also needs to involve a willingness to spend more money. Last thing, most important thing, although there has been increased diversity in our region across a whole variety of measurements, that does not mean that the problem of residential and social segregation in the greater Boston region and even in the city has disappeared. In some ways, it's gotten worse. In many ways, it is less discussed, less talked about, and less recognized. But we still live in an immensely segregated region by income, but also by race. And there are many efforts, particularly in our housing market, to make sure that this will remain the case. It is one area 
where although there has been change and improvement, we like to pretend there's been more change and improvement than there actually has been. From my perspective, on the regional level, but also as a resident of Roslindale, where I'm kind of a newcomer, I've only lived there for 44 years, but um, as, a, thank you, as a resident of Boston, but also managing a regional organization, I don't think there is a greater challenge to the region than social, residential, and economic segregation, particularly among the races, and it has to be something that we focus our attention and our energy and our money and our will and our passion on. Successful regions take the benefit and engagement of all of their residents. And they do so in a way that encourages networking and strengthens economies and creates a better region for the next generation. In my opinion, that has to be our number one challenge and goal. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a, a, a follow-up question for John that is more than, um, how do you want to echo? Oh, no, <laughs> John will be just fine. No, no, I, I am struck though, John, that, that um, particularly on this, I'm also struck that Mark actually put something ahead of housing, although then you put housing back in the right. equation. Yeah. Um, John, I, you know, same, same question for you about what do you see as, as the most pressing challenges and promising opportunities. Um, and, and I'd love for you to pick up on, on Mark's last point because it seems to me that's been a focus of a lot of your, your work before being in, in city government and now in city government. Um, as most of you know, John is the head of economic development. Uh, Chief of Economic Development for, this, for the City of Boston, uh, former Executive Director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, uh, former Chair of the Boston School Committee? No, school former School Committee member. Former School Committee member. Um, and um, what would you like to pick up on of, of, of what we've covered so far? No, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Mark, uh, Mark's last point. In fact, if I was to rank my three challenges, I would rank that number one. I think the uh, you know, Standard & Poor's has issued a warning to the United States saying that economic disparity and the growing disparity in America is the single most uh, concerning threat um, to our economic growth. And that in fact, if we don't uh, uh, begin to address the issue then America's economy will stall, the American economic growth will stall, and at some point become dysfunctional, right? And so for me, this question of disparity is, is central to the work that the Walsh administration is doing that I'm focusing on, I think critical to the city, critical to the region, critical in fact to the country. Um, let me throw out some numbers so that we can sort of all kind of appreciate what we're talking about. When we think about economic disparity, what does that look like? Um, the Federal Reserve issued a study recently, and uh, in the in this name of the study is called The Color of Wealth, right? And it's a very interesting study. Um, I, I should have brought it with me today, did not. But in the study, it's the first time uh, that we go beyond black and white and we begin to get look into ethnic groups and begin to think about whether we can find some patterns that are interesting in thinking about sort of who's doing some certain things well and who's doing certain things not so well and how we can learn from each other. But one of the things that was striking was, um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll do them a little bit by ethnic groups, but also do the, the typical black and white sort of comparison. Uh, for a white household in Boston, the average median uh, net worth is $256,000. Uh, who can guess what the average median net worth is for a black household in Boston, except for you. <laughs> 20,000. 20, Who else? I think it's $8. $8. Mm -hmm. For African Americans, $8. For blacks, totally $700. The absolute right. $8. Um, $8. 
Who can guess what it is for Dominicans? Huh? Guess. 2,000, you think? That's right. Somebody who's read the report. Zero. Zero. So, so and, 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 but the, and the disparity is doing this, right? And there are major concerns in the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Boston, but all over the country is saying, hey, folks, we need to pay attention to this, right? When you look at um, employment, the country's unemployment numbers hover above 5%. Boston hovers about 4%. And in fact, first quarter this year, we were at 3.7%. <clears throat> Boston's unemployment does fairly well. Anybody know the employment, unemployment rate of Grove Hall? Guess. 17%, close to 20%, right? And when you begin to take certain, certain sections of our population, let's say um, men of color, uh, under 35 years old, um, working age to 35 years old, um, that becomes a scary 30 percent, 30 plus percent in the city of Boston. When two-thirds of our male population in the city, two-thirds, 63 percent to be sp uh, precise, of our male population in the city of Boston is of color. So, two-thirds. Two out of every three uh, young men in the city of Boston under the age of 19 would be a young man of color, right? So when you begin to look at the growth of our population, the increasing diversity in our population, the increasing immigrant um, uh, population in Boston, and then the disparities that that comes with, um, you begin to see a very, very concerning future, a less productive, less, uh, less uh, more marginalized, uh, uh, less uh, connected uh, population, something that we are paying serious attention to and um, are going to continue to announce new policies to address, such as the mayor uh, creating a new office of economic empowerment to look at this specific issue. And we've created a number of different centers around Boston to do one-on-one -on -one coaching for individuals and begin to think about how people can plan for asset growth and um, uh, debt uh, decrease because the debt part is the big problem. When you do an analysis on who owns homes, same kind of disparities. When you do an analysis on who owns a home with some equity in, in it, the disparity is even worse, right? Highly leveraged communities in our, in, our, in our city. For me, this is the biggest problem we have in our city, and the trends are scary. The second, though, would be uh, similar. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's around this growth uh, or, or, or the growing need for us to develop local talent to meet the growth in jobs, because we are growing in jobs, and the, new, and the demand, continuous demand by the employers and in different sectors that are growing and booming in Boston for talent, right? And so healthcare, healthcare in the last 20, in the last 10 years, 15 years, uh, grew by 32%, 32%. We now in this area have about 268,000 healthcare jobs and they're looking for talent. It is the fastest growing sector in our economy, followed by professional services. Um, that, um, and, then, and then when you look at the types of jobs that we've lost in our, in our local economy, the types of jobs are manufacturing jobs that we lost during the same time period by 40%, right? And so the disparity in job types I believe some 82% of jobs that are listed in Boston today, you need a bachelor's degree for. 82% of jobs. Um, 
And so Boston is, is quickly becoming a city of, of the haves and the have-nots, because at the same time that we've grown in, and, and, let, me, and let me just tell you, more than 85% of the $7.2 billion of development in Boston today is around luxury condos. And if you haven't heard about the, the most expensive luxury condo in our marketplace today, it's a, a $37.5 million condo on top of the Millennium Tower. And you ask yourself, who can afford that? Not I. Uh, so so, so if, if 85 plus percent of our residential units are being built for the ultra luxury, ultra luxurious, uh, then and we have an increase in our city of poor people at the same time, then who's being squeezed out? The middle class. So you've heard the mayor talk about, in fact, the need for more working family, moderate rate housing in our city. We think it's critical. We actually have indication that um, your great work, Mark, that, that, that looks at population growth that in fact we're, we might be growing at a, a rate that's a little faster than those projections, um, uh, creating more pressures on housing. Um, the immigration population, I want to talk about this in terms of lo uh, supporting local talent growth. Um, <coughs> immigration population is the fastest growing population in our city. And this was a presentation done at our cabinet meeting by uh, Alvaro Lima, who is the director of research at the Boston Redevelopment Authority, looking at Boston and Boston's growth. And um, Alvaro basically said, here's the immigration population, here's its growth trajectory, and then looked at sort of um, this new study that was released in a book that was published recently called Step for Success, and I forget the author's name, but in Steps for Success, it charted the immigrant uh, um, so the journey in cities like Boston and the barriers that they found. So, if, so typically, and I forget the numbers, but typically, a typical immigrant professional with a certain set of criteria is earning 40% less than their equivalent counterpart here with the same credentials. Right? So you have doctors doing work that are, are, are uh, uh, less productive, if you would, from, a, from an economic standpoint than other doctors here because they're immigrants. And so this question of the immigrant population and how we maximize their, pro their productivity is a really important one for the region. Boston does well, though, in terms of maximizing jobs. We do $24 billion more, the region does, than the United States on average in terms of job productivity. Right? And, but we can't seem to figure out how to integrate the immigrant population that is really well um, uh, educated, even though they do a lot better, of course, in integration than those that are not so well uh, 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 educated. They're not maximizing their productivity. The last thing I'll say is this. Boston is growing at an amazing rate. Um, our GDP continues to grow at an amazing rate. Um, the, this is creating a lot of pressures. And in fact, we are talking more and more about the how we responsibly grow the city without displacing the city. Right? How can Boston, Bostonians benefit from the growth of our city? Right? And in many neighborhoods, I recently looked at an economic analysis that showed that the current median income in that neighborhood and I think in, 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 in most of our neighborhoods, this is true. In some of our neighborhoods, the percentage is really high. But in most of our neighborhoods, the current median income in that neighborhood cannot afford the next generation of home sales. So, and in certain neighborhoods, it's as the line is, is, is as high as 42% above the median income. Right, cannot afford the next generation of home sales, which means if you own your home and you decide not to sell at a certain income level, you can remain there. But if, if anybody uh, uh, sold, it would not be to a person of the same median income. So the displacement in our neighborhoods are real. Um, so the question of building a city that would house the current residents or their children or grandchildren 
is of great concern to, to the mayor and I and something that we are, uh, we're looking for different policy uh, responses to. Those would be my three sort of uh, uh, challenges for the city moving forward. Trying as, I tried yep. to stay away yep. from some of the yep. no, no, I, I, this, this, is, this is sobering. Um, I have been asked to ask all three of you to move slightly, to move into the light. Yes. Come, to, come to the light side. Closer. <laughs> come, come closer. Um, let me say, I, I apologize, I should have said this because sometimes we don't talk about businesses enough, but the small businesses are under pressure in our city. And it's the same economic tra um, trend around sort of people not being able to exp um, ex uh, uh, afford the next generation of home sales. Our small businesses are not, they are not able to keep up with the rent increase in our next generation of building renovations. Case in point, the theaters in our city. The theaters, most of our theaters and are, are, are 30 plus, plus year old. They're old theaters, they need some, some investment. They need uh, some renovations. And in the renovation of our theaters, the, the uses of less than 25% with uh, days of lights on, and that's being gracious, is not enough to justify the cost of renovation. So, so I think this is a, it's a, it's a growing uh, issue in our city, and I just wanted to lay it out there around this question of growth without displacing the assets and the people and the businesses we really care about. Um, that, that actually is a wonderful lead-in to our, our, our third speaker, and I'm, I'm really particularly happy that Cassandra is joining us um, because um, it's... I think as both of you have highlighted, the, the, the importance of, of getting a, a more diverse range of voices at the table, um, and particularly younger voices, um, is, is really important. And um, we're really fortunate to have Cassandra, um, co-founder of Fresh Food Generation, which is a farm-to-table food truck um, that uh, serves healthy, affordable, prepared foods in um, a variety of low-income neighborhoods in Boston. Um, uh, a, a youth activist who came through some of our wonderful programs, particularly the Food Project, um, somebody who left the city for college, came back for graduate school. Um, but so Cassandra is charged uh, in, in the discussions we had before the event with both being a voice of small business, right, uh, operating a, a food truck, but also um, trying to capture some of the emerging voices in, in the city. Other than that charge, you're doing, you're, you're doing fine. But but you know, I think you bring a really unique perspective to this set of questions, both as the challenges you face as a business person, but also the challenges that you see every day running a business in, in some of the neighborhoods we're talking about. Um, so where, what do you see? Is that two or three big challenges or, or promising opportunities? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with John and Mark that uh, housing hmm. and- Lean that mic in just a little bit, there you go. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> that housing and income inequality um, are two of the biggest challenges that face the city. Um, as a business owner, I need employees with stable lives. Um, and that's really hard to have in Boston. Um, and I actually started out in the housing world. I was working for preservation of affordable housing. Um, I finished my degree at MIT in urban planning about four or five years ago. I can't hear you. Okay. I will try and speak louder. Um, talk into the mic. Just don't touch that button. So I received my planning degree from MIT about four or five years ago and decided to move back into Roxbury. Um, I grew up in Roxbury. I had great models like John Garros and DS and I. Thanks. <laughs> he can touch it. <laughs> I had great role models um, and really wanted to stay in my community and make my community better. Um, the idea for Fresh Food Generation really came out of one moment. I was at the Roxbury YMCA um, on Martin Luther King Boulevard. I stepped out and I saw this young man stepping out of Popeyes. He was obese and struggling to walk. 
Um, and my first sort of instinct was to blame his parents. Why would his parents let him go to Popeyes when clearly he is struggling with a huge health problem? And then I looked around and there was a McDonald's, another fried chicken place, a liquor store, a corner store. This young man had no other option. Despite this, we were on a street that had multiple city parks, had the YMCA, had several community health centers, and yet there was the option to exercise and be healthy, but not the option to eat healthy. And so there was this gap for me in the market, right? We had the public sector and the nonprofit sector doing their job in providing spaces for people to be healthy but there was nothing in the private sector creating a space for people to choose food options. Um, and so a lot of people thought that I was making a huge career change, leaving the field of affordable housing and starting a food truck. <laughs> but in fact, I was not. Affordable housing is about um, creating opportunities for people to live healthy lives creating stability in people's lives. Uh, access to healthy, affordable, cooked foods is about making sure that communities are healthy. Um, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan have the highest obesity and diabetes rates in the city. Um, Mattapan in particular, about 30% of the adult population is obese. And so we started with a simple plan of having a food truck that would go to different neighborhoods and would source from local farms and would cook foods that were culturally relevant to the people who lived there um, and that we would hire people from the neighborhoods to do this. Uh, and the biggest question I got was, well, how are you going to make the food affordable? Um, you know, and we were able to figure that out um, by talking to local farmers, by catering for corporate businesses and doing cross-financing strategies. And so th that was no longer the problem. What became the problem was being a small business in the city of Boston and gaining access to capital. What also became the problem was creating jobs for our employees um, that paid wages that could allow them to live. Um, the Popeyes that I spoke about earlier at the time had just opened. And when it opened, it created 54 jobs. And over 1,000 people applied for those 54 jobs. Um, and so Popeyes had at the time sort of become a marker of community development. And for me, it was, we have to do better. We can't create low-income jobs um, that in turn, um, <laughs> create low-income jobs um, and also put our communities at risk for health problems. Somebody uh, agrees with you back there. Yeah. <laughs> Seven times. <laughs> and so, you know, as a business owner who has a planning degree, I often have my planning hat on and am constantly working to push how much we can pay our employees. Um, and it seems that even with that effort, um, what I pay my employees is never enough to be stable in this city. Um, my employees are very aware of the cliff effect. They know that if I pay them a dollar or two dollars more, they are suddenly at risk for losing their housing. They then have to make a decision of whether or not they want to work those extra hours or if they want to put themselves in a situation where they could potentially lose their housing. Um, I have to f fill out forms on a regular basis. 
And so for me, you know, even leaving the field of affordable housing, um, income inequality and housing is still a top priority. Um, access to capital is a top priority. We are, you know, a new, relatively new business startup, um, and it's amazing how hard it was uh, to get a loan. Um, and I also read The Color of Wealth. <laughs> um, but I wasn't struck that, you know, black people on average have $700 worth of wealth. Um, and white families on average have 256,000. And the reason why I wasn't struck is because um, being from a low income household in Roxbury growing up and later on getting degrees at elite institutions, I've had the opportunity to walk in both worlds and see both sides. Um, and it's clear, you know, people in both spaces love their families People in both states, you know, have high degrees of intelligence. The only difference is, is how much wealth people have. And so as a small business owner, you know, trying to do the right thing, uh, it's very difficult in the city. And uh, it's, it's, it's not only up to businesses to pay their employees good wages, but we have to create an environment where people who are working 40, 60 hours a week can go home um, and support their families. Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm struck listening, I'm struck just generally listening to, to all three of you. Um, If we think about the Boston of 50 or 60 years ago, it, it's, it's a relatively stagnant economy, one that, that in many respects felt quite closed. All three of you have spoken about um, the need to essentially make, ensure that the benefits of growth are, are, are more widely distributed. But that also assumes that there will be growth to allow that to be distributed. So, so I, I, you know, how, how hard can you squeeze the goose uh, you know, um, and and what I, I guess from all three of your of your perspectives, to what extent can uh, you push? How far could, are you finding you can push the folks who are making investments in Boston to 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 basically follow the courses that all three of you in, in slightly different ways have outlined? Um, and and where are you getting the, are seeing the most pushback of, of this sort of economic engine? that has been driving the economy for a while? Are we in any danger? What do we need to do to make sure that that keeps going? <laughs> Sorry for the inartfulness of the question. <laughs> you know, if I, if, I, if I heard the question right, um, I, think, I think in your question you presume a finite pie, right? Um, when you think about how, you know, how we, we, we can squeeze and where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, the other way to think about it is, in fact, um, uh, creating growth or an engine of growth. And what are the elements for growth so that the pie is bigger, right? And, and in fact, uh, Boston's biggest promise is our talent. Right? We, we export more, more PhDs than you know, any other city our size in, in, in the world. Um, and people come here for talent. And so as I talk to employers, their thing is, how do you give us more? Mm -hmm. Right, and so more people are coming to Boston, and we've done more ribbon cut-ins uh, recently than I think in a very long time, and we're competing for a, a multinational right now uh, headquarters in Boston, and you can't tweet about it or anything, but <laughs> it's it's secret. But we're in a we're in a, we're in a different place where people want to come here, but they can't come here unless we can really grow talent. Right, so our ability to grow. It, it comes in from our ability to invest in our most precious asset, human capital, right? So affordable housing, uh, talent, uh, um, 
that those kind of supports mm -hmm. are public education, et cetera, those, you know, connecting people to jobs. I mean, all of these things here make it that the pie continues to grow. S&P's warning is if we don't continue to invest in the people of the United States, right, um, then we stagnate that growth, right? And then you're talking about who's getting more and who's getting less, right? So, so the point is not to take those who are making the most money and cap them, right? That would, be, that would be a problem. The point is to have more people make more money, right? And continue to push it up, right? And so, and the only way we can do that is invest in people. So that's, that's, that's point one. Point two is this. And the more people that can get in on the game, then the more there is for everyone, right? Because it's just, I mean, it is just, a, it's an economic, uh, 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 a piece of, yeah, the competitive, it's, 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 it's city, regional competition and not us in our residence, right? And so Boston's competing with San Francisco, Boston's competing mm -hmm. with New York, Boston is competing with other areas of the globe, uh, Boston is competing with, competing with France, et cetera, right? And so, 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 so that is, if you want to take it from a finite standpoint, and even then I think the global economy can grow mm -hmm. if we continue to invest in, in, key, in key elements. So, I, so I, would, I would reframe the question. And the reframe question is, how do we continue to create an economy that works for all, or as many people as possible, right? Because then it works for each one of us better. Um, and, and in fact, that perspective, that frame, will allow us to make sure that um, we, all, all boats, all, the rise, the, the tides will, will rise all boats. And in fact, that we don't get into a point where we're saying, if I have, that means that you can't have, or if I can't have, that means it's the only way that you can have. And that's just the wrong way to look at it. Mark, I don't know if you want to, or Cassandra, I don't know if you want to weigh in on, on, on this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I think is a conundrum, I, and, John, and John says I, I have it misidentified. Uh, I agree with John, the solution is to, to grow the pie bigger, but I think um, that poverty is urgent and stressful for a lot of families now, and um, we need solutions that can redistribute the current pie now. Um, and uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> you, don't, really, you don't want I, to repeat that question. Well, no, it's, I mean, really, it's really, it's, it's, so it, 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 you know, put it, you know, when John's negotiating with, with the multinational, right, there, there's this strange negotiation, right, of on the one hand, they want to know what are you going to give us to induce us to come here. But on the other hand, you're sort of saying to the multinational, what are you going to give us to, to make this um, so that it's it, worth, worth the region's while? Um, and I think, Cassandra, you know, you're saying that that's a discussion that, that in some ways is too distant for the, for the very real issues you're seeing, you're seeing today. So, you know, this question, can, can we grow, maybe, can we grow and address the equity issues? So I, I think we can grow and address the equity issues, but I also think that we need a cultural shift um, in the way that we think about things. I was actually um, in Back Bay yesterday and overheard a conversation um, between two young men um, and they were talking about luxury housing in Boston. Um, and the conversation was about this one developer getting bad press. Um, and the response was sort of like, eh, you know, these developers are gonna come and, and replace housing for low to moderate income families. It happens, not a really big deal. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why Boston is ranked the third highest in the nation in inequity is comes down to being afraid and cultural values. Um, are we willing to do what it takes to make sure that everyone can live in this city? Um, 
you know, I think equity sounds really nice and everyone is willing to raise their hand and say, this is what I stand for. But when the question becomes, okay, do we want to build luxury housing, um, you know, for people to live in or, or, or do we, are we okay with living with people who don't look like us, who maybe make less than us? Um, and those are sort of the real deep questions that we have to ask ourselves as we work on creating a bigger pie for everyone um, to share. And I think, I think that their demographics of this city is clearly changing. Um, and, you know, if you turn on the radio, if you listen to NPR, um, there's lots of questions and push for a more equitable society. And, you know, it, it, I couldn't have this talk without mentioning Black Lives Matter. Um, these aren't a group of young people who are misguided and still have leftover teenage angst. These are young people who grew up um, with parents who were working 40, 60, 80 hours a week and still not able to provide for their family. And they're saying enough is enough and they're trying to disrupt sort of the calmness and uh, saying, well, you know, it's sort of life. We'll just continue building luxury housing. Um, and, and we all know that, you know, we can make the pie bigger. We can't make Boston physically bigger. So once land is um, purchased and, you know, used for a particular purpose, it, we've lost it. it. It stays luxury housing for a long time. Um, so I think that there is a need to um, think about our values and think about ways to redistribute wealth. And the city of Boston, we have very smart planners and policy makers, and we have tools like linkage fees. Um, you know, I won't even mention, you know, <laughs> I, I won't even mention, you know, Putting rent, um, sorry, putting, rent. Putting rent control back. <laughs> rent control. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there, there's a number of policies in place that if we were ready on a cultural level to say we really do want a city that everyone can live in, that we could probably proceed with. But I just don't think we're ready. So, Mark, one I'm, item that, that I would, would mention is considerably less global than, than certainly what Cassandra was talking about, but I think it's nonetheless relevant is, you know, to address any of these issues, there are certain times you will go to the private sector or to new developers or to property owners or to taxpayers or to anyone and try to get them to give more and contribute. And I, generally speaking, am pretty supportive of that, and I, I think we could go pretty far still and do that and not discourage people from being in what is an extraordinarily hot real estate market. However, not everything that we do to try and get a better city is, uh, and a better region is necessarily extraction. There are other things we can and should be doing. Um, one of those that we talk about a lot at MAPC is reforming our zoning and permitting procedures. Uh, that would actually save people money. It would get things built faster. Uh, we always say that it's not a matter of um, allowing every developer to build anything everywhere. It's a matter of deciding on the municipal level, on the state, I mean, on the regional level, and on the neighborhood level, what do you want to go here? And what do you want to go here? Where do you want housing? Where do you want mixed use? Where do you want commercial? Where should the industrial uses be? Where do you want growth? And what you should, what are the rules about the growth you're looking for? Is it 10% affordable? Is it 20% affordable? What, is that, what does affordable mean? Because affordable today means much higher income than it did when I started in planning school. Um, but set those rules. And then when developers come in, if they meet those rules, permit them like that. You know, allow, allow boards to conduct joint hearings 
instead of sending developers, nonprofit or for profit, through you know so many hoops that take so many years, um, automate the system for permitting in in the Greater Hartford region, which is you know not exactly the strongest economy in the world. They have an automated multi-municipal permitting process for people who want to get building permits. I mean, these things aren't, you know, they aren't impossible to do. There are techniques that can be followed through statutory change, through regulatory change, and just through good business in government, if I will, that would actually save the private sector money and help us meet some of our goals. And that's just one. There are others. Yeah. I, I want to stay for a second on, on Cassandra's point, but but to turn it slightly uh, for, for Mark and John in particular, um, w one of the striking things that came out of the series of conversations that led up to tonight was, in fact, the emergence of a new set of institutions and, and the transformation of older ones. Um, I, I spoke a little bit about that in, in my opening remarks. And, and um, you know, Mark, coming out of the CDC world, which really in a sense, came out of a previous generation's frustration with what, where they saw the city going. Are there lessons of, of how that institutional, and, and John, of course, coming out of DSNI, are there lessons for how we balanced some of these forces in the last 50 years that one can offer as, as ways to proceed? Either do the current institutions allow us to respond, or, or do we need, as we did 20 or 30 years ago, to begin inventing new institutions, uh, or mainly just adopting uh, computerized uh, permitting is, is the answer. No, but I, 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 I'm, I'm being serious here. Do, do we, are our institutions and, and the ways we make decisions capable of, of taking on the issues that, that Cassandra was talking about? And, and if not, where, where do you see us needing to push? Yeah, I mean, I think, so there's, so I think Cassandra's right, right? So it's not just about growth, it's about responsible growth, right? And so let's look at how we deal with housing, right? Uh, so at DSNI, we spent years building the largest urban land trust in America with about 34 acres of housing and a land trust, uh, out housing, open space, and some small business space that's permanently affordable. Now that is not part of how America thinks about housing. You buy a home, it goes up in equity, you sell it and buy a bigger home. I mean, that's the, that's the journey around housing, right? And then it gives you options where, you know, maybe you wanna go into the suburb and then you become an empty nester, and maybe you wanna come back to the city. And so there are all these options about housing that are about economic, it's, it's an economic commodity, right? Well, for a certain part of our society, that, 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 that's not a luxury. Stable housing is critical for stable families and stable communities, right? And so how do you and rethink about sort of housing as just a commodity that those who can afford buy <coughs> and then resell to those who can afford and then they resell and, 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 and understand it as a foundational piece to our society and stability. If that's the case, then we begin to build different types of housing, right? And begin to create different types of transaction in those houses and become far more creative in how homes are sort of passed on to different families, how you create equity and how it's used, et cetera, in housing. And I think we need to, that's one institution that we need to have a critical, creative look at if we're going to actually begin to have different policies and grow responsibly. I'll just take it in sort of a different direction. I agree with what John said. I'll just look at it from sort of another side. Um, I, I worry a little bit about where we are institutionally in the region now. Um, I think that there are, you know, th there is strength in various movement sectors. Cassandria mentioned several of them, Black Lives Matter, the food movement generally, particularly those elements of the food movement, I think, that focus on lower income people. Uh, and on local food within an urban setting. Um, I think the CDCs uh, and, and other similar organizations like DSNI are, um, are a source of strength as well. But I think we're having difficulty 
generating new institutions in the way that we, we once used to. And I think this is not so much a Boston problem. I think it's an American problem. But we do see it here. And I think there are multiple reasons for this. One of the reasons, oddly, I believe, is that, you know, all things, that there are some older people who have really wonderful ideas. <laughs> I, I'm having less of them every month. But, but really, a lot of energy in our society comes from young people having great new ideas and having the guts and the gumption and a position in life to be able to take some risks and do that. And when they're coming out of school or graduate school incredibly saddled with debt, it's very difficult for, as many people, and I know nothing about Cassandra's personal circumstances, but it's very difficult for students to have the story that Cassandria just described to you. And um, there are plenty who still do it, but it's not easy. And I think that it is more difficult to found a nonprofit organization now than it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, it is more difficult to fund an organization of that kind, almost regardless of sector. We also face another reason why it's difficult is because the philanthropy in the city has changed tremendously. And one of the ways in which it changed tremendously is we just are, with the exception of the incoming multinational corporation that John is going to successfully achieve today or tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow, probably. That, that we don't know about. Yeah, that we, we don't know, know about. about. <laughs> um, we, have many, we have many fewer headquarters here than we used to. And that hasn't reduced the number of philanthropic dollars, but it does sometimes reduce the risk-taking that philanthropic organizations or charitable entities within corporations are willing to take. There's an awful lot of call back to the home office before you're willing to take a risk. So I, I am a little bit worried about whether or not we're going to generate the new institutions we need because existing institutions can accomplish a great deal and they can revitalize themselves. That often happens, doesn't always happen though. You still need to have new institutions, new ways of dealing with things coming up into the world. And that can't only be new ideas in the private sector, although that's very important, but it needs to be new ideas in the nonprofit or the social sector as well. As I've been listening, I mean, really very sobering um, set, of, set of challenges, you know, really very fundamental issues on the table and, and as Mark said you know at a certain point it, it did not feel particularly optimistic um, and yet uh, I think there are two reasons uh, to be optimistic um, and, and I without without being a Pollyanna being being I, I was trying to get my students to be skeptical I can't decide whether I want them to be skeptical optimists or optimistic skeptics but one one of those two things the two reasons one um, as we've learned over, over the course of, of these four sessions, this is a city and a region that um, has confronted major challenges and found answers and solutions often in, in very unlikely places. And, and in fact, uh, you know, one of my mentors, Ed Glazer, uh, among others, has, has made the argument that that is the history of Boston, you know, as celebrated you know, here at the Historical Society. This is not a region that has great, great, great natural resources. Um, in case you hadn't noticed, our weather is not always particularly great, tonight being no exception. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of off at the edge of the continent without a great uh, access to transportation, and yet, again and again, it's the human capital of this region that makes, that has allowed us to, to address challenges, and unlike many regions and cities, have a series of economic uh, and social renaissances. So that's the first reason to be optimistic. The second reason to be optimistic are these three people, right? Which is three very talented people at different stages in, in their careers, each of whom brings you know, creativity, passion, uh, intelligence, uh, and humor um, to the work that has to be done. And, and as long as we have people like that doing the work and, and a talent pipeline that at least has got a few Cassandrias in it, 
um, I think we're going to be okay. I don't quite know how, but, but I think we will. Um, and I, I hope that that is, in fact, one of the lessons we end this really wonderful series that Gavin put together. So join me in thanking the panel.